way we think about gender identity and sexuality is always transforming. And sometimes folks have a hard time keeping up with all the changes in language. Our friend, Dr. Larry LaFontaine, travels all around the world talking about LGBT people and Latin American culture. And one of the most common questions he gets asked is, what is Latinx and how do you translate the word queer into Spanish? Today, we take an amazing rainbow-filled journey to the cutting edge of gender and sexuality to understand how what may logically work in one language may not translate into another. Plus, a trigger warning on trigger warnings. The silver lining of finding Prince Charming. Sexy, muscular trans men and the new reality TV show, Strut featuring Leith Ashley De La Cruz. And rest in peace to two very different pioneers, Christian fundamentalist comic book publisher Jack Chick and musician Pete Burns. I'm Fausto Fernos. I'm Mark Fillion. And this is Feast of Fun. This is our 12th year of podcasting at Feast of Fun. Thank you to all of you who have been along for the ride. We couldn't have done it without you. Are you prepared to have this one-of-a-kind program disappear forever? Please take a moment and make a donation at feastoffun.com slash donate or get a t-shirt at our store, feastoffun.com slash store. And now, enjoy the show. Her name was Lola, she was a showgirl, with yellow feathers in her hair and a dress cut down to there. Hi! Como estas? <laughs> are we on? We are on. <laughs> our guest today is once again our good friend Larry LaFontaine, who besides being Lola von Miramar, the fabulous Latin American drag queen who ignited our series Cooking with Drag Queens, or as they say in Spanish, cocinando con las transformistas. Also travels Latin America as a scholar talking about a wide range of topics, including queer studies, American culture, romance languages, and women's studies. Welcome back, Larry LaFontaine. Thank you, Fausto. Thank you, Mark. Hi, guys. Hi. Hola. Hey. Es Larry. Hola. Es Larry y también es Lola. Lola Bon Miramar. Who am I talking to right now? Well, that's a really, really good question. Some would say I'm Larry. Some would say I'm Lola. Because <laughs> you're like, as you travel around the world, you're meeting all these, all these kind of people and you're talking about Latin American culture and LGBT identity and academia. And you get asked a lot of different kinds of questions, right? Sure. And and actually, I actually, sometimes I travel. I don't literally travel as Lola because I don't get onto the plane in drag. Uh, but I do travel to do performances. And sometimes I do travel more as, a, as an academic. And it's interesting because I, I do I do cross uh, that bridge in terms of performing and talking as a scholar about LGBT and queer identities. And people are really curious about what queer means, even though we've been using it for so long. People are really curious about what queer means or how do you translate it into Spanish. And people are also really curious about this new concept of Latinx or Latinx, this new uh, gender neutral or gender inclusive term to, to write about Latinas and Latinos, especially in the United States. So someone comes up to you and say, excuse me, I have a question for you. <laughs> Explícame esta cosa que to... queer co... qué es eso? Explícame. Uh. I don't think I've ever had anyone put it quite like you just did, uh, but because usually I, I, I it in I, my I, old Cuban woman uh, who, uh, making coffee. And, so what was the question? Esa cosa queer. <laughs> ¿Qué es eso? No, because you don't have a word queer for in, in Spanish, right? Queer. So, ¿Qué es eso? Well, so so first of all, the word queer in English still generates lots of anxiety and questions mm -hmm. because even though it's been used in activism. Um, on, in television and in academia for over 25 years, there's still a lot of people out there in the United States that aren't familiar with those usages, or maybe they, they're familiar, but they don't agree with them. So that, that's to start with it, even mm -hmm. in English language. But then in Spanish, now 
you have especially academics and activists in Latin America who follow up and read about global trends and developments in LGBT rights and in feminism in Europe, in the United States, in other places. And they're also trying to grapple with, is, is this a term that we want to translate and use, even though it, it's, it's an English language term that doesn't have the same charge or history in Latin America? It, some people think, can we just invent new words? Sort of even the word queer is not quite an invention. It's a it's a reclamation. We're taking over, right? Mm -hmm. It was in the United States. It changed. It was considered odd, it, unusual, odd, different. unusual, and then it was also considered homosexual, stigmatized, yeah. undesirable, mm -hmm. uh, effeminate, faggot, uh, and for some people, it still means all of those things. Well, one thing I always notice is that when we're fighting for gender and sexual diversity in other cultures and languages, it's really important not to be a, co a colonialist and impose our values on them. So it's really important to, to acknowledge the history of terms and how these words uh, don't just uh, magically appear. They have very specific chronologies. Even, even the term homosexual, which was invented in the 19th century yeah. around 1869. Uh, even, even the word gay, which many people see as a universal term, but in fact, it wasn't even used in the United States with this meaning until the 1940s and 50s. So in Latin America, in the Spanish speaking world, World, around the world, there's just a, a multiplicity of terms, and th those terms are, are meaningful and, and relevant. And uh, if you really want to be able to understand that complexity, you just have to pay attention to local or what we call vernacular terms. Vernacular terms are those specific words that are used in, in different locations and that have a specific history. So when you're trying to translate the word queer into Spanish, say like in a book, uh, what kind of words do you usually wind up using? So, so it varies. So some people Puto? prefer uh, um, raro. Raro just means you roll the R. Es un señor R raro. Raro. Does that mean rare? Yeah, no, it means strange. Okay. Uh, it means strange, but you know, so for some people that, that really uh, captures that essence. Some people, they get excited about new words or neologisms. So I introducing a, a new term can be useful, but then so queer or queer, but then it's like, how do you spell? that in Spanish. You mm. can spell it C-U-I-R, um, which is actually um, leather in, in French, but you could also spell it the English way. I saw in uh, Turkey they had a, a gay rights celebration. They had a sign and it said queer. It's spelled K-W-I-R. Mm, fantastic. <laughs> so like these well, phonetic spellings. One of my favorite parts of Spanish language, because I, I you know, grew up bilingual, is a term that in Spanish we call them anglicismos. Which in English translates to what? Anglicism. Anglicism. So it's one word that it, you know, and this is a really example. So in Spanish, we could say un pastel, but some people say pound cake. <laughs> and you could say, you know, well, I have a, um, un Pancakes, churrasco, but they might say un bistec. <laughs> Voy para el library, quiero buscarme un libro de baseball. You know, so, there, so it's all, all these kind of words that are... There's a, something humorous about it to me is about just taking the word and just moving it into another language. And it doesn't just happen in English and Spanish. It happens in Japanese um, with a v word coffee, for example. Mm. Uh, Japanese people say coffee. Mm. I don't know about that, but in French they say yeah. le weekend. Le weekend. Uh, so, you know, there's yeah. lots of linguistic borrowing and, mm -hmm. and that's, that's, that's just natural. It's, it's part of languages coming in contact and ideas coming in contact and crossing. And uh, so uh, as a teacher, uh, I am a university professor in, in the classroom. I, I really stress the, the history, the genealogy of terms, but also as a public intellectual or as a writer, even as a performer it's it's funny sometimes i'm in drag but but the drag show has has this pedagogic component it feels like the classroom uh in, it, sometimes because i'm explaining terms uh, but sometimes just because i'm explaining references lots of young people don't know who carmen miranda is for example or very basic things that for us they don't watch bugs bunny cartoons <laughs> shame on you well they know that bugs bunny dresses up as a funny lady with fruit on the top of her head but they don't necessarily know that Carmen Miranda was an amazing samba singer in Brazil in the 1930s. They came to the United States, that she was born in Portugal, but raised in Brazil, that after she came to the U.S., the high 
class in Brazil rejected her. She died very tragically, very sad. Oh, she did? Yeah. Um, it's, so there's a, there's a fantastic uh, documentary called Carmen Miranda Bananas is My Business, which really explores... <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's my business. Stay away from those. <laughs> oh, my God. Why did I think of that one? <laughs> So if you see uh, some of those films from the 1940s, like the gangs all here, it's, it's, it's sad because she was really stereotyped by Hollywood into this character of a human being, mm -hmm. even though she was really such a talented artist. And so for me, for example, as a, a Latin ex or a Latin ex or Latino queer, as a Latin American Caribbean gay man, uh, a reference like Carmen Miranda is really crucial to understand who I am and what queerness means to me. And that might or might not be the case uh, for, for example, a gay white American man. So a, a big part of your performance and your research and your writing is not just cross-dressing, but crossing over from one culture and one language to another. That is absolutely correct. I, I, I frequently envision it almost as being a bridge and sort of bringing these, these different communities or cultures or languages in conversation with each other. And that's why we love you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so what logically works well in one language doesn't always translate to another. And, and one, one term that I've always throughout my whole life uh, heard, and this is kind of a new thing, is the term uh, Chicano, mm. Chicana, in, to refer to uh, American uh, people of uh Hispanic origin oh, or Mexican, identity? Mexican. Mexican. Mostly. So, so yeah, yeah Ch Chicano is, is, and Chicana are, are terms that were popularized in the 1960s in the Southwest, uh, specifically to talk about people of Mexican descent or people who sort of wanted to resist the, the category or the label of Mexican American as a hyphenated identity. And they saw it as a more radical term. And then there's the term Hispanic, which was uh, coined in the Nixon administration. So during uh, the Nixon administration in the 1970s, the U.S. Census Bureau once again started counting people of Latin American or Spanish descent in the United States. And after a process of consultation, the term they uh, adopted was Hispanic. But there is some resistance to that because some people, particularly on the West Coast, feel that that alludes too much to Spain or the Iberian Peninsula, and they want to reclaim their Latin American indigenous mestizo identity, which is why the term Latino and Latina, which is the gendered version that refers to, would refer to a woman or a group of women, was more popular. And, and now we're even at a new moment, um, as my students constantly remind me, students are always at the forefront of linguistic innovation and new concepts and uh, revolution. Because they got nothing better to do. <laughs> I don't know, because like things haven't... Uh, they're not set in their ways. They're not know? set in their ways. Uh, their ideas haven't fossilized or sedimented. They're open to new things, and they're also trying to change the world. So so my students come up to me. You know, we, we always... So when I... In the past, you had Hispanic Heritage Month. Then we moved to Latina, Latino Heritage Month. And now my students have Latinx uh, Heritage Month. They, they talk about Latinx organizations. Literally, they have the same way the, the transgender people have introduced new pronouns and new concepts and new, new ways of speaking. So young Latinx or young people of Latino descent are proposing linguistic innovations that can be challenging. Uh, you mean young people of Latinx descent? <laughs> <laughs> and some of whom are queer Latinx. Or well, let's explain this for the listeners because so for the people that don't know Spanish, because uh, if you're a girl, you're Latina, right? And if you're a boy, you're Latino. You're assigned those you're terms. You're assigned those terms. Or you claim those for yourself, but now this new one has, instead of the O and instead of the A, it's just an X. And so that can stand for like a group of people, whether you're boys and girls together, or if you just want to just kind of be ambiguous about gender or it, gender's not important to you. That is correct. So the Spanish language is highly gendered mm -hmm. and, and most words, almost all words with some, uh, some exceptions, are either gendered masculine and mm -hmm. feminine. And that means that the article, the noun, the adjective, all, all have that mark of gender. And in Spanish, uh, historically, a uh, 
large groups of mixed uh, men and women are described using the male term. Mm -hmm. And some feminists have seen this as an example of sexism in language. And and so so that has a lot to do with it. So challenging this notion that we're going to use the masculine term as a way to refer to women and men. Mm -hmm. And they're proposing like a a new Mm -hmm. a new term, new concept that somehow like goes beyond gender, beyond that gender binary for more inclusive language. The challenge is that sometimes it's easy to write these things, but it becomes much harder to pronounce it because, for example, we can't even agree whether it's Latinx or Latinx or it might have even some other type of pronunciation. Well, in the, in the early 90s, uh, I lived in the height of the AIDS crisis in Austin, Texas, where I went to school, and a lot there was a lot of uh, gay Mexican uh, Tex, Tex-Mex influence there and i noticed that uh the the popular term was latino hyphen or slash ah or uh using just female pronouns to refer to anything so <laughs> it's like you're gay just just the same way we do in the show when we say we shoehorn the word she or her into into our words <laughs> like she larius <laughs> you know her story um we we uh back then they were shoehorning uh female words or pronouns or prepositions into uh I'm sorry, not uh, articles into into common everyday words. So they would say like la taxi or la la mar or, you know. And I I was recently in I was recently in South America, in Chile, uh, attending a a performance conference with lots of like radical queer and feminist performance artists and and feminists. And and they they were even like gendering everything into Spanish. And also lots of people are like switching uh, um, vowels. And so to move away from the O and the A binary. So they're just throwing E. So it actually it sounds a little bit like it's in French, but so How does that sound like well, so uh, so instead of talking about los estudiantes or las estudiantes, which would be the students, they're talking about les estudiantes. Uh, Très bien. You know, it's it's it's. It's it's disconcerting at first. You don't even know what they're talking about. So instead of saying el mundo for the world, they're saying la munda. And I kind of like that. It's very playful. It's very very playful. But but for play to succeed, you you need two people to sort of agree to be open to to that game. And you have some very traditional, very conservative, very resistant people who who think that language should be frozen, immobile, and don't don't realize that language is a constantly shifting and changing practice and that it's important to remember how language worked in the past but it's also important to be open or to understand why language might change in the future it's kind of just reminds me of uh, kate bornstein about uh i think it was like 10 years ago um z her uh, are uh, uh, Kate was busy. I think Kate now uses female pronouns uh, mm-hmm. most of the time. But uh, for a while, Kate was really working hard to use the the, the gender neutral pronoun Z and her in place of she, her, or he, or him. So this is very relevant. But I don't think it caught on, and and also has to do with like the new the introduction of the term they as they them theirs as preferred uh, singular pronoun for people, and so but my my big uh, conversation or what I encourage people is to really acknowledge the history of these terms and to be aware and open so to the possibility of using them now, but to also remember that people like Sylvia Rivera in, in nine, the early 1970s or even during the Stonewall Revolt, the word transgender didn't exist. You know, they were using words like uh, transvestite or drag queen uh, or gay or homosexual, and it was it was the terms that, that were available back then. And and it's 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 very it's crucial to understand that a certain historical moment for some people, those might have been the terms that were meaningful and relevant. Even if we choose not to use them today, we understand that they are perhaps outdated or or not as useful or necessary as they might have been in the past. Uh, Larry, what's a a sort of good way to approach in dealing with uh, gender neutral language in new cultures and new approach, you know, new situations? Well, to be open to listening to people. 
uh, and to be aware that not everybody is at the same stage of, of their linguistic development and that not everybody, that some people are experimenting and proposing radical changes and that for some people this might be very, very new. So, you know, to be uh, cognizant and, and mindful that, that e even when you're proposing radical linguistic change, you have to be patient with some people that might not be up to speed or might not even understand what it is that you're asking them to do. So um, in terms of like the press, like newspapers in Latin America, have any mm. adopted the use of the term Latin X? This is, La so Latinx? this is really, really interesting. So what you see is a very wide uh, variation. I, I just published a, a short book called A Brief and Transformative Account of Queer History. And it's a bilingual book. And uh, in Spanish, it's Un Breve y Transformador Relato de la Historia Queer. And uh, when I was doing, when we were doing the Spanish edition, I personally started using the X uh, to get around the gender binary in the Spanish language for O and A. But the person who was doing the copy editing, who's a much more traditional person linguistically, was having a really hard time. And uh, in, in my mind, you know, this is a book about queer history. It's a book about challenging conceptions of gender and sexuality. And if we can't challenge language here, where, where, where on earth are we can possibly do it? So fortunately, Dave Bushen, who is the general editor of the series, who's also the artist that illustrated this little book that we actually uh, did a little puppet show video for the Feast of Fun with. So he was like, Larry, you can you feel free to use the the linguistic uh, experimentation or the spelling that makes sense to you you're the author uh, but but you know it, it was you 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 want you want the copy editor to be happy with you you don't want the people that you're working with uh, to feel frustrated because you're you're doing linguistic innovation is, is it possible to like give a, a, a what is it a, a dictionary or a, <laughs> some terms defined at the beginning of the article or so something? yeah so actually I did include a foot note because uh, I was uh, not only a, a footnote, but when I do public presentations, like I take a moment and I say, when you read this book, or even as you listen to me reading it out loud, you're going to notice that there's some weird mm -hmm. or unusual stuff going on. And that is because there's a group of people proposing non-sexist language. And we're really trying to think through what would it mean to speak in a different way from the way that we were taught as children or in school as normative to envision uh, a language that really responds to the necessities of a different conception of gender and sexuality. And uh, let's talk about politics here with Spain, because uh, Spain has its own institution that's very conservative when it comes to language and rules, whether these words are introduced or accepted or not. So the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language really sees itself as a monitoring organization that sets the standard for all Spanish uh, around the world, including Latin America. So there's real resistance. And each country in Latin America has its own linguistic academy as well. And oh, these, I didn't know that. these linguistic yeah. academies get together and they decide and they update their dictionaries. But are they very are, hot debates? Yeah, I, I because the, I, I think they're probably very very hot because these organizations are very resistant and slow to accept change. But on the street, our artists, activists, people are constantly innovating language. Language is a living thing. Language is something that's always being transformed, but you know, but it's juicy and sexy. It's delicious, but it's really it hard. If, your if you're a teacher <laughs> in the classroom, you know, you're trying to teach rules and norms. You're trying to make sure that people master standard language. But, but if you're an activist or a creative person, you're trying to think of how can I possibly change language? to help language reflect society as society changes, so our language changes. Uh, that's just, uh, I love this conversation. If people can uh, want to 
book you for, to talk about this stuff because I think a lot of people actually listening to this podcast are just kind of blown away by this conversation. Uh, they can reach you on Facebook, right? Sure. Um, Larry LaFontaine on, on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, if you love drag, uh, Lola Von Miramar is also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Will Latinx catch on, do you think? Will it stay so around? The, or how this, will it influence it? I, think that's spe- that, I know it's speculation, but please. This is an amazing question. So it's not not only an amazing question for Latinx, but also for they, them, there, for her and Z. Mm-hmm. So it's a huge question. Every time you throw out or you propose a new linguistic practice, uh, the question, is this going to stick? Is it going to take? Mm-hmm. Is it a real reflection of something that's being embraced? Or is it a passing fad or trend? So I I think for Latinx to, to as a new way of envisioning Latina and Latino or people of Latin America, American descent in the United States. I think the impetus is really strong. So it seems to be catching, although, you know, it's it's slow. Young people are much more open to using this or people who are politically open. Uh, but it, it, these things take time and there's no guarantee that, that it will be successful. Well, I understand like with they, they using as the third person singular pronoun used to be a thing that they did in English until the 1800s. And then some grammarian said that, no, it's incorrect. You should use he, she or he or she. And now people are saying, please use it as, as a replacement. And, you know, in some ways you kind of already are using it every day because like when you talk about somebody in the third person you're like oh they're an asshole <laughs> right <laughs> i never thought about that yeah so ah, people like you, you, you do use it uh but there is some people that are like kind of like ruffling their feathers mm-hmm. about it but i recently saw a video of, of, from a linguistic person he's just like listen that's the way it is now and just get over it <laughs> so i think for for me uh the the fascinating and challenging thing about when a gender non-conforming person uh identifies their preferred pronouns as they them theirs is that you know so it's a singular person it's one mm-hmm. person but you're using uh the pronoun that typically is for a group of people so sometimes it's just confusing when you say they did it it's like they did it was it one person was it several people so i think it's going to take us a while mm-hmm. or people who are well, open-minded yeah. to accept the use of this pronoun we're just gonna have to say calm down mm-hmm. take it easy there's a little bit of confusion maybe i don't quite understand what's going on but if i want to respect and be open to what this person is telling me that they want the pronoun mm-hmm. to be well then maybe i can make that small effort to go along with it and use it because that's what they have said that they want and i wonder how that will change too because like if in english we don't really have for, for the third person plural it's just you or you you all and then there's you have various dialects here in the united states so they have tried to different things like in in pittsburgh it's yins for you all <laughs> you know in the south it's y'all mm. and then, you know people in boston have their own thing and some other colloquialisms here and there so i wonder if something will happen to the they will that because like in some way they're going to distinguish between the they plural and the they singular uh, trigger warning. <laughs> uh, we're getting into the trigger warning part of the show. Uh, in a lot of academic circles, and uh, it's sort of like spoiler alert mm-hmm. when it comes to movie right. reviews. And, yeah. it's, uh, it, some people are demanding, getting angry or upset when uh, any kind of images or subject matter gets presented that can uh, be very... Um, uh, push people's boundaries in in one way or another, and uh, as as a professor, uh, what do you think about uh, people requesting that you say trigger warning before you present, say, a film that might you know make people distressed or so it's a upset. it's a interesting question and an issue because i've personally I've, I've i've never adopted the use of the term trigger warning like for me that's just uh meaningless it's not a term that i use personally but i do believe in in informing people particularly my students when there's going to be something that is very potentially upsetting or, or strange especially at the beginning of the semester when you have students signing up for a class i really want them to know that this class is going to be focusing on very 
complicated, perhaps controversial, delicate issues having to do with sexuality, gender, potentially violence. And for, for me, it's just it's just a type of courtesy uh, in terms of, of interpersonal relationships. You want people in that room to acknowledge that we're going to be having some very complicated conversations. I think that they're crucial and important. So so, for example, if you're going to show a movie that is very violent or has graphic uh, blood or things like that, I think it's just a polite thing to say. You know, we're going to be talking about forced sterilization in Puerto Rico and the fact that the Puerto Rican government, with the help of the U.S. government, was sterilizing most women or at least a third of women in Puerto Rico. You know, you want this to be you want you want students to be able or people to be able to deal with, with the fact that it's going to be a very complicated conversation, not to avoid the conversation, but just to sort of find common ground to to talk about things that are very difficult or potentially painful. Well, what do you make of the uh, University of Chicago this past uh, August or September I- issued a, a warning to the students that they're not going to ever get any trigger warning and that they should expect to be upset by things at the university? Was it their way of just being like, you can't sue us be, like, be, for scaring you or something? Or what do you think? I think it's unfortunate. I don't think it's a role of administration to talk that way to the students. But, you know, administ- the university administrations are trying to manage very complicated complex scenarios in which you have competing demands. I think ultimately it's really the role of each individual instructor or professor in the classroom to develop that relationship with with their students or, you know, you guys with your audience or whoever you're interacting with Mm -hmm. to figure out what what are the norms of civility that are going to allow us to have a variety of conversations that can be potentially uh, uh, controversial and difficult in a way that is that we mutually respect each other. The following podcast may contain strange language, freaky things, and orgasmic ideas. Caution is advised. <laughs> or the following is a paid commercial program. The network assumes no responsibility for its content, so you know this show's going to be really shitty. <laughs> the opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect my opinion, so don't be complaining to me. All suspects are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. These are all what you could consider trigger warnings. So anybody who complains about all that stuff, like the University of Chicago, doesn't watch television, obviously, because television is full of that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, aren't they? It's more like disclaimers. Well, they have, well, they that's have the warnings same idea, like yeah. for, for mature audiences or yeah. for kids, the TV 13, TVR, you go to a movie, movies are rated, and they tell you what exactly is in the movie. So it's like, why do we expect from our, uh, no warning from our education, but we expect it from our entertainment? Now, in Japan, uh, they have a problem uh, with people sitting too close to the TV set. So they say uh, before any kind of anime programs, they say, when watching this program, please make sure the room is well lit and don't sit too close to the screen. Oh, really? (laughs) Does sitting close to the TV really make you blind? I think it's not a good idea. Um, another, some cooking shows says the recipes presented in this program are to be followed exactly as written. <laughs> that would be challenging with cooking with drag queens Adios. until we get the cookbook out there. <laughs> <laughs> and in Australia, uh, when they have, um, uh, fiction or history programs, they say this program may contain the images and voice recordings of people who are now dead. Aww. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh, today, uh, uh, two big cultural figures that are part of uh, our history uh, here at Feast of Fun passed away. One of them is a uh, musician, Pete Burns, best known for uh, their contributions to the band Dead or Alive, of their uh-huh. 80s hit. You spin me right round, baby, right round like a record. Ba-. So we had Pete Burns on the podcast uh, scheduled to talk for an hour, uh, for a good amount of time. In 2010. In 2010, uh, Pete uh, had a resurgence in popular culture uh, through his appearance on the reality TV show um, Celebrity Big Brother UK. in the UK. And um, I think Pete still to, uh, identified with male pronouns, but presented in a very gender-neutral 
uh, non-conforming, non-conforming way and, and was obsessed with body modification and piercings so much that uh, he was prohibited by his friends and family and handlers to get any more work done. Well, Pete snuck out out of our podcast to get his entire face pierced. He was pierced from the left side of his face to the right. It went like right across his face. That is a lot yeah. of piercings. Yeah, it was went through his cheeks. And uh, I guess it, so he was kind of a little out of it when we talked to him. And then we found out later it's because he was just like he had just gotten his oh, whole face pierced. Oh, wow. So uh, if you want to listen to that uh, delightfully awkward interview as if. Mm. All our interviews aren't awkward anyways, but uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Feast of Fun, and learn more about uh, Pete Burns's brush on podcasting fame for mm. a brief moment. And uh, comic Christian fundamentalist, uh, comic book artist Jack Chick, who if you've ever hung out on a university campus and a right wing fundamentalist Christian has ever handed you a comic book tract, um, those wonderfully bizarre uh, ones where, you know, they're against Jews, Muslims, other types of Christians, homosexuals, cross-dressers, transgender, well, transsexuals, they don't use the term transgender, um, and it, pretty much anybody else, everybody's going to hell except them, and you have to repent and accept Jesus into your heart. But uh, Jesus, Jack Chick's comic books uh, got a huge following, including me in my early years, because they were so outrageous and over the top and used such visual language to sh to really reveal uh, Christian fundamentalists for who they were, which is very um, people are sort of lost in the chaos of their own making and confusion. And uh, so uh, I guess it was announced on their Facebook page that Jack Chick died at the age of 92. Oh, wow. Rest in peace. And so uh, when I went to grad school here in Chicago, I auditioned uh, with a performance piece about a young girl named Bianca Bridgeforth, <laughs> who uh, asked her neighbor if she should have sex with her boyfriend. And her neighbor said, honey, her name was Mrs. Huchila. She was a very a woman of uh, low morals. <laughs> and she uh, said, honey, uh, there's a cure for everything these days. Uh, just a poke in the right place and you're you got it taken care of. Well, Bianca doesn't realize that she develops HIV and AIDS and goes to her doctor who condemns her sinful ways and asks her to repent for the kingdom of Lord is for the kingdom of Jesus is near. And uh, Bianca in the comic original comic book gets on her knees and repents, which is very sort of a oral sex position. My version. Well, you're humbling yourself before the Lord. Yeah, but she's she's on her knees before her doctor, which is kind of a weird image. Uh, in my version, she uh, basically uh, um, karate chops the doctor and steals his wallet and. And runs off in a Thelma and Louise ending into the Excellent. sunset. And those Jack Chick uh, <laughs> little comic books were also responsible for those like Christian hell houses that they'd have around Halloween too. Oh, they? that's right. They inspired yeah. those. Like uh, those were always like you'd go in and you'd like uh, be, you'd walk through this thing, and would, instead of scaring you with monsters, they'd scare you with like homosexuality and sodomy, video and games, then, uh, video games, and uh, abortion clinics, <laughs> internet. Mm. This young man spent too much time. On social media, now he's going to hell. But you know, I I think they, there was something that, about them that was really kind of they had a nostalgic kind of feeling for them because they were kind of almost felt like they were from another time period. Even when you saw them like in the eighties, because I haven't really seen one probably since like maybe the mid nineties. They also hated George W. Bush because they, did? they felt he was not pious enough, oh. and so they had one track that is like, "You think you're being a good Christian by." Voting for George W. Bush, you are wrong. You, he's going to hell, and so are you. And it was like it was it, it was a no-win situation. You could not be Christian enough, according to Jack Chick's viewpoint. Um, he was uh, presented as as the most read comic book artist of all time. Um, you know, some called him the Stan Lee of Christian conservative <laughs> movements. And considering that a lot of his tracks, his comic books were bought and freely distributed all over the world. It's an easy argument to make because, you know, ain't nothing Marvel or DC comics. Uh, they don't give away their work. So rest in hell or heaven, Jack chick. You your early work was a, uh, Quite something else. Now, Larry, you're a big fan 
of the reality TV show that we're not too crazy about called Finding Prince Charming, yes. where a uh, designer and uh, uh, Roberto Antonio Sepulveda Jr. Gutierrez Gomez, I'm not sure what his <laughs> name is, he's looking for love. And he just keeps on eliminating right un, uh, people that he finds unattractive. And unfortunately, those unattractive people happen to be people of color. And, <laughs> and is that fair? Is that a fair criticism? Mm, okay. That's one black guy still at the bitter end. Um, so r there, right now, I believe there's still five contestants, including okay. a, a very handsome, very fit African-American contestant. I love Finding Prince Charming. <laughs> I think it's a hilarious or she hilarious program that I've enjoyed enormously, perhaps because I am a single gay man and like just find the whole idea of of this house full of single gay men hanging out and bingling with each other and competing for the attention of a Puerto Rican. Did I mention that Robert Sepulveda Jr. is a Puerto Rican gay man who's very attractive and very very charming. So how can you possibly not like this show? It has like a, a well, it, I don't want me. I don't know if we have to do spoiler alerts, but one of the contestants is like an absolutely delightful little queen called Robbie. Who's they call him a low budget <laughs> um, Laganja Estrancha. Uh, Robbie La v Riviere, who's, uh, who, who's had been on quite some uh, um, reality TV shows himself and on an Australian sh uh, shopping channel. Huh. So, so, so they're trying to sort of find a vehicle for him to sort of make him into his own reality TV show. And they're saying that the next season of Finding Prince Charming will probably have him uh, which I think would be much more interesting, having a very big flaming sissy oh. looking for love so instead of a stone-faced uh, butch person like uh, Robert Sepulveda. Sepulveda Jr. is not a butch stone face guys but anyway <laughs> he has personality uh, he I has the other, absolutely the only, lovely personality and the only, I would the only love concealer to meet him he's, the, only, the only thing he's uh, worried about is a concealer on his skin I was like he's he's Who very cares? He's attractive. He's articulate. He's multilingual. He's from Puerto Rico. He has lots of interesting things to say and loves to make out with all the different guys. You have 13 guys living in a huge mansion with a swimming pool and lots of alcohol. There is a lot that's not being shown in this program that might be happening when the cameras are off or perhaps even in front they of them. Don't let happen. them talk to each other when the cameras are off. I just they usually escort them to different it, rooms and different but how places. How can no? And these you know the boys guys share rooms. They share. So they're kicking all night long. There's 13 this men. This is the thing, though, too. Sometimes I don't know if they do it on this reality TV show, but a lot of reality TV shows they have people like go into bed, and then when the when the, as soon as the, like the cameras are off, the people get up out of the bed and go to the hotel room and then go sleep oh, in the hotel room. Oh well, that would be quite fascinating because now, I don't know if that's happening on oh. that show, but it did with uh, Santa's in the barn, right? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think that maybe that's why uh, that Sam spit on that guy because he was probably hearing him snore all night long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he spit on him because he has uncontrollable anger issues. So Sam was not the best participant. His violence was really noticeable. I mean, it made for good television drama. But I have to say, uh, can I repeat, as a single gay man, uh, I just love the concept you, of a gay dating game. In have which, you ever watched these gay dating, or have you watched uh, these dating romance shows? No. Real World, the Bachelor, Big Brother, oh, any of those things? I've no. watched The Real World, but no, I've never watched The Bachelor. So I don't really see that much television. I love gay gay, trans, queer television, which is why I like Transparent. Mm -hmm. I like the new show Strut on Oxygen. I love RuPaul's Drag Race, but I don't really see regular television. Okay. I mean, part of me is like I wanted Finding Prince Charming to succeed. And I, and I think it failed in the sense that they picked somebody as the prize who wasn't very playful. You know, he's a, he's somebody he's who's very stiff. Play, he is not stiff. He, like, you know, likes <laughs> you to got, do you're, exercise. You're cute, yeah. I don't he, think I'm ta talking about, like, his flexibility of his body, but in terms of his emotions, his vulnerability, his comfort in being awkward. And, and I felt like they started off on the wrong foot by having him sort of betray all the contestants by hiding amongst them and um, spying on, mm. on everybody, which uh, a lot of the contestants d didn't 
like that very much and and uh, let their feelings know. Well, I mean, for me, I have to say the other titillating fact is, of course, that we all know that he is a former escort and former or current escort, perhaps. And so, the, the, which has not been addressed on the show. So, so there's there's almost like this backstory, this back drama. I mean, talk about not revealing fully who you are. You're trying to seduce or to fall in love with these guys, and it's not clear whether these guys know or mind or might mm-hmm. care that, that you have a, a past as a right. sex worker. For me, that's absolutely fascinating. I, I really wish that was discussed more openly because, mm-hmm. you know, some people have been very forthcoming about their HIV status or about losing partners, about being, you know, having had a partner die or commit suicide. So the issue of sex work, I think, would really um, raise the level of the conversation about what it means to engage with different people. So, so that doesn't have a sense of humor about the show or himself because he's he's banned um blocked on twitter uh two people who have made parodies of his shows who are actually parodies. comedians comedians <laughs> who have made really nice wonderful parodies sort of uh pointing out the show's inconsistencies or shortcomings and you know if you're putting yourself out on a tv show like that you know have a little sense of humor that's all I can say. Well, he's also, I think uh, he's saying that he's being bullied by people on the internet, too. And it's just kind of like, you know, they are revealing his past and who wants their past revealed like that. But if you're going to go on a reality TV show, expect that kind of stuff to happen, especially if you worked for years as, you know, a sex worker. People were going to bring that up. And he's he is not he's trying to present as a prize, a monogamous very traditional relationship mm, with right. him, even though his own history as a gay man doesn't match that goal that mm. they're seeking to. Well, listen, um, I, I uh, uh, am preeminently a scholar of the Puerto Rican gay experience. For me, the fact that there's this very attractive single gay Puerto Rican okay, on television right. and is generating... You get a free pass. <laughs> you get a free pass, Larry. Thank you very okay. much. So first, first there was there was you Ricky know? Martin yeah. and now we have Robert Sepulveda Jr. Yeah. Can we just yeah. get a famous Puerto Rican guy who's hot, uh, who has a sense of humor and a good looking in media. I already married him. Besides, <laughs> oh, thank you. Besides us. You know, and the thing is, know, like, is that having a, uh, the past as a sex worker, and I don't necessarily think that on the TV shows he would necessarily have to reveal it. It would be great if he did. But it's one of those things. It's like, you know, if you've worked as a sex worker in the past, if you're starting on a new relationship, that's not something you might... Um, drop in the first 30 days of being locked up in the house with a potential mate. You know, that's something you might tell them five or six months after they get to know you. Mm. Bit, you know, So uh, Robert has been forthcoming about this issue on the talk shows, so certainly now it's, it's out there, it's on television. Because he was forced to. It just hasn't been but integrated hasn't into really the show itself. Honest about it, he portrays it as so something he did in college, but people are saying that he was doing it up until just recently. Some people are actually saying that he was doing it during the, the tour for... <laughs> <laughs> the the show and that is why Lance Bass walked out on the project and says I will not work with this man anymore. Listen, another reason to love Robert Sepulveda Jr. from Finding Prince Charming is that he hangs out with the protagonist of Strut, another fabulous reality show featuring transgender models. Are you talking about Laith Ashley, my bromance from Facebook? <sighs> Laith Ashley is mm. just let's clarify adorable. one thing. Adorable. Laith Ashley is probably the hottest person on, on f- social media. Uh, ripped. I thought he was Puerto Rican. He's Dominican. Dominican American. D- D- New York Dominican? Oh, the Dom- New York Rican. Do- um, uh, Dominican York is, is a term that Dominican people Dominican York. Anyways, so Strut is a totally different reality show, which I am also watching obsessively, uh, especially because of Laith Ashley de la Cruz, who's an absolutely charming Latin ex- uh, uh, model who formerly trained as a social worker and who's just really sensitive and all of the girls on the show are madly in love with I him. I think the world is madly in love with him. <laughs> I mean, just so good looking and sweet. Leif is, is and quite, charismatic. quite the catch. He's quite the catch. So so I think that that's why Strut has been so fun. You know, it's it's been it's it's a show about transgender models trying to make it big and be successful in the world but you it's very endearing you really fall in love with with these individuals you want to know about their story you want to know what happens to Dominique and her relationship with her husband
president with whom she's been for 19 years. You want to know what happens to ISIS, who was a former contestant on on a modeling show. You want to know about Ren, who's doing super well, and Arise, who has a huge personality and is very assertive about being African American and not apologetic about how she looks. Who's who's the villain? So, oh, <laughs> they are definitely villains. They are minor characters that come in and out. And, and some, even, even the characters themselves, sometimes when they've had a little bit too much alcohol or they're just having a hard time figuring out their life, can sort of become the antagonist in different situations. But you have, it, the show is mostly people of color. So, so the agency has at its lead uh, Cecilia or Cece Asuncion, who a gay Filipino who's absolutely charming and, and funny and he's he's working mostly with African American and Latino talent with, with a couple of white models. So I have not seen such a diverse cast in a long time in a, in a queer transgender show. It's absolutely refreshing and and the, the protagonists are frequently on Facebook Live so you, and they're total Twitterers so you can contact them on and, Twitter. And how did uh, Whoop whip you go over because uh, she's the producer, right? She's, the, she's one of the yeah. executive producers of the show, and I have to say I really appreciate and I'm very thankful that Whoopi Goldberg is supporting uh, this program. You know, whether it's just for entertainment value, you can say there's certain a little bit of frivolity or the same issue of, you know, the high, high fashion, fashion models. It doesn't really res- correspond to most people's experience. But in terms of entertainment or just falling in love with, with these specific individuals, there's a lot there to to like. Well, and certainly like Laith is is just gorgeous. I think this is a more vehicle for him than anybody else. And he mm. certainly has a future uh, in whatever industry he chooses to go in. And uh, the show is produced by Whoopi Goldberg, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. who seems, uh, I guess, it's kind of an unusual departure for her to produce television shows of any kind. And, uh, and I don't, I don't know, know how that, that came about, but uh, you can check it out on the Oxygen Network. And uh, I believe you can watch the first episode for free on Whoopi Goldberg's uh, Facebook page. Yeah. And if you don't have uh, Oxygen, you can watch it on Amazon, which is what I'm doing. But also, let me just say that in terms of the representation of, of transgender people's relationships with their parents, so the, the focus on Leith's relationship with with their mother, uh, with his mother, who was who a Pentecostal Christian woman, a Dominican, a Latina woman. She's very uh, passive aggressive with her son. But it's been it's really it's fascinating to see the development of that relationship or even Ren the the development of Ren really Ren's relationship with with his father has also been really fascinating so that is a you know this show really tries to hone in on on some delicate topics that that are really universal mm. so if you're uh, interested I, I think the three hottest uh, trans Male physique models or bodybuilders is, of course, Leith Ashley, uh, Paolo Bautista, who was here in Chicago, who we got to uh, get to know really well. Got to work out with him one day. Wow, yeah. fantastic. He was just at our gym, Not, and I was like... We didn't get to know him that well. <laughs> Not because I didn't try, but it was... But he was busy. He was busy. And, of course, uh, you guys might remember uh, fr- from the cover of the Men's Health, uh, the first trans man to be on the cover of the fitness issue was um, Ben Melzer, uh, who's, you know, also everyone's kind of dream falling in love with them. And, and some people point out, it's like, yeah, it's easy to fight for uh, trans equality and, and to be accepted when you're this smoking hot, gorgeous, muscular guy. And mm. are we really like, you know, are we really expanding or changing anybody's conceptions of anything when it's sort of like this very, um, um, you know, widely accepted uh, image of masculinity mm. or femininity. You know, it's mm-hmm. like what happens when you're overweight or uh, or you look in a different way. So, yeah. I, so I would just say, so maybe the interesting thing about strut is how race and ethnicity comes into conversation with transgender experience. So to use a word from feminism or academia, so intersectionality becomes relevant in this show because it's not just about being trans or, or trans white person, which is, of course, what most people are more familiar with, with Caitlyn Jenner or Chaz Bono. It's about being a trans person of color. Mm-hmm. That's what's so interesting about this show. There seems to be a certain idea out there, too, that trans people of color tend to transition much earlier 
than white people because white people st- have a sense of um, privilege. And so they don't necessarily have to uh, contend with their gender identity at such an early age as somebody of color is. So what, are you like Trump and you're saying to uh, young trans black people, you got nothing to lose? Uh, you know, that that's part of it, too. Is like far, from part of it, too, is like they talk about, you know, young people of color. They're being policed but for their sexuality as a, at a young age where some, you know, where white people necessarily aren't. Well, one thing that I find interesting is it's like looking at Paris is Burning, 1990, where some of the girls like like Octavia St. Laurent, that was your dream. And when we saw Paris is Burning in 1990, most people were absolutely incredulous. They thought, well, this is ridiculous. This trans woman is never going to be a high fashion model. And here we are 26 years later. And that is exactly what is happening. Mm hmm. Uh, it's fantastic. And then, of course, there's Tracy Africa. I forget what her that was her stage name back in the day. She was a model who was trans and she was on the cover of Miss Clara for six years, I believe. And then it was discovered that she was trans and then she lost her job. And now Clara has brought her back and she's in her mid 60s. She looks fantastic. And they're like, come and come back in. You know, it's a whole new world now. Guys, we uh, we want to remind you, the, your listeners, that Feast of Fun is made possible because of your financial support. Uh, if you're not financially supporting this podcast, uh, someone else is, and you're riding for free. <laughs> so thank them for giving you a, a free tuition to Hunty University. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, uh, we really do count on your financial, su- su- fi- financial support. So please go to feastoffun.com slash Donate, make a one-time contribution, or consider becoming a Plus member and helping make this show possible so we can document and inform a wide variety of people about the LGBT experience, and especially on this show, about the Latinx or Latinx experience. That is right. I prefer Latinx. I prefer Latin X, like Malcolm X. <laughs> Latinx, Latinx, say Latino, let's call the whole Latino. thing off. You don't say Latino or Latin A. No, you, well, I say Latina, Latino, and now I say Latin X. <laughs> With a snap. Coming to you live and direct from Andersonville, Chicago, Illinois, United States, Latin X queer culture for you. We also have fantastic t-shirts at our store, feastoffun.com slash store, uh, and also mugs. Get yourself a Feast of Fun mug or a unicorn puking up a rainbow. You'll it's love it. It's beautiful. Unicorns and rainbows. Oh, my. Larry's drinking tea out of it right now. With two tea bags. It's a mm-hmm. really nice mug. We, we don't make any money from this mug. We just had to make it so make people like two dollars it's like a couple of bucks and it's like it's it's a really nice mug i was actually holding it in my hand and i was like you know this is totally worth what we're charging for it at the bottom of the rainbow it kind of looks like skittles yeah Aww. it's an, you know i i, I kind of like uh it was originally like a puddle and i kind of like changed it so it was more dotted because i wanted it to more be more magical you know and you know the idea that that like unicorns make rainbows when they get a little Dizzy. <laughs> uh, you can follow uh, Larry LaFontaine on Twitter. Which, what's your handle? Larry LaFontaine. Larry LaFontaine. Oh, La it's Larry LaFontaine. It's, it's, it was Americanized by my great grandparents. Oh, really? Is the, is, the, is the original pronunciation of your last name was LaFontaine? So, no, no. So the spelling. The spell, my father was from New Jersey, but his family was from French uh, Canada, from Quebec. Oh, so it's so, a French name. Uh, yes, but in Puerto Rico, everybody says La Fontaine. La Fontaine. So that's why I say Larry La Fontaine, but you spell it Larry La Fountain. Uh, I'm, and uh, on, uh, coming next on Cooking with Drag Queens is Cynthia your, Lee Fontaine. She, isn't she your cousin? That is fascinating. Uh, and the answer is no. Oh, uh, but <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. Why not? Is she Boricua to the max? Boricua to the max. <laughs> so no relationship to Larry, but uh, they're soul sisters in many other ways. Absolutely. So, Larry, it's always a pleasure having you on the show. Muchas gracias. Bye, everybody. Bye. Adios. Bye. Bye.